So it is my absolute pleasure today to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jeremy Burton, who is currently the chair of the Urological Sciences within the Division of Urology and Department of Surgery, and is also cross-appointed to the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Western University in Canada. His interests include, obviously, the urobiome and how it influences urological conditions such as kidney stones, cancer, infection, overactive bladder, and what impacts the microbiome, such as diet, pharmaceuticals, biomaterials, fecal transplants, and additionally, so a personal interest of mine, the use of antibiotics. Um, most of his research career has been focused upon the relationship of commensal bacteria to human health, so I'm really excited to hear his talk today and how it relates to urobiome work. Yeah, thanks very much for that uh, introduction, Grace. Um, I thought that I would uh, step out of my comfort zone just a little bit uh, today and talk about a side project uh, that we have going on and, and looking at the uh, potential of uh, imaging modalities, uh, looking at the, the Eurobiome. So um, I do have a, just a tiny little introduction, but really the Eurobiome uh, doesn't need much of an introduction to this group. Obviously, there's a lot of expertise here. And it's uh, one, one of my favorite groups to actually come and listen to. Um, and uh, we, we're obviously, as, as Grace alluded to, interested in many aspects of uh, urology. And uh, we believe that both the urinary and the gut microbiome can uh, influence these in a number of ways. So we do do a lot of work related to urology, but we also cross over and we help a lot of people that are interested in microbiota. And we find that that actually cross fertilizes a lot of what we do because a lot of people are interested in therapeutics and other things and, and other ways of looking at microbiota. So yeah, we, we do do a lot of um, different things related to uh, urology and some of those are interventional and some of them are sort of more, you know, looking at what is the microbiota in some of these conditions. Um, and, and it's really, it's, uh, you know, still apparent to me how much we have to learn uh, about the microbiota in relation to urology. So in this diagram, I I sort of, I like to think of the microbiome as not just sort of one microbiome, but a whole collection. I've drawn it as a, a tube map here of all sort of the interconnections. So we've got the ones that we kind of know of and, and you know, all the links that we know of. And, and uh, you know, some of those now newly, you know, include up to the bladder and other places. But we, we're also not as sterile as we think we are. And we, we're potentially... You know, um, you know, giving microorganisms across, you know, other sites, gastrointestinal sites, periodontal sites, and and so we still got a lot to learn about things. You know, where where microbes come from in the neuro microbiome. You know, where the, the pathogens go, where do probiotics go? How do you know? You know, does BCG work? Where where does it hang out when it goes to the bladder? So there's still a lot to answer, and so it seems that whenever a new technology comes along, we learn just a little bit more about the Eurobiome. So we started off in culture and there's been a resurgence in culture sort of based technologies. But, you know, a lot of us here use different techniques depending on our particular interests. So a lot of us have done 16S, but, you know, some of us are interested in RNA and protein and metabolome. And each time someone, you know, does this, you know, we, we learn a little bit more. And, and what's done is often dependent on our capabilities and also how much money we have. Um, so th there's also, you know, some new work that's kind of going on, uh, you know, people developing new models and and uh, new ways of looking at the microbiome. We, we've used a Drosophila model for, for a long time for, for um, looking at stones, but also we're sort of, um, we, we are looking at uh, spheroids and other things. We're looking at new models that are maybe a little bit more representative of the, the situation uh, that we're particularly interested and this has sort of led us a little bit to, to uh, looking at imaging so you know maybe we can look at the microbiome directly uh, with imaging and we have a really good imaging group here uh, in in London and so it seemed to make sense to work with them so you know imaging's got a lot of potential examples because uh, advantages because um, you know when we collect a microbiota sample you know we're always risking that we're contaminating that sample, whether that sample's changing its abundance, um, those sorts of things. And when we collect a sample, we're always also wondering, you know, is that the true sample of the particular site that we're interested in? Is, is that, is, you know, the sample that's really at that mucosa or, or sample? And, and is that sort of in real time as well? 
So today I want to talk about just a couple of uh, side projects, which uh, is, a, is a little bit out of my comfort zone, but talking about MRI and PET MRI, which actually might complement our uh, ex vivo uh, Euro microbiome analysis. So, you know, this isn't new technology, but it's really ever applied to microbes. So I know I'm, I'm saying this disclaimer a lot that I don't know much about imaging, but I really don't. But I am very excited by it. And I've got some great collaborators. Um, I've shared an imaging student, Sarah Donnelly, who's done a lot of work, uh, collaborated with Donna Goldhawk in uh, Lawson Imaging here, and Frank Prato. And, and uh, Frank is 77 years old and sharp as a knife still. And he was actually responsible for the first MRI here in, in Canada and is actually based here. So we've been doing imaging here for, for some time. So some of the clinicians will be more familiar with some of these imaging modalities and, and research scientists will be more familiar with others. So um, we, we have different uh, tools for looking at sort of different parts of the body. So things like MRI and, and CT. So CT is x-ray based. Uh, PET is uh, a radioactive emitter. Um, so, so these are sort of modalities that we can look at sort of a larger perspective of kind of what's going on. As scientists, we're sort of interested in the sort of molecular or microbial level of things. So we're, we're down at the other end of the spectrum. The, the trouble is that we don't get a good mix of those two in, in um, whatever sort of modality we're using. So we're interested in, in what's going on uh, perhaps with a bacteria, but not necessarily at the site. We, we, as scientists, we need to take that ex vivo and we don't get the, the penetration using the tools that we use. So the confocal microscopies, the optical microscopies, those sorts of things. So we used uh, tools like, uh, you know, fluorescent proteins, green, red, to try and sort of label things. In, in this particular case, this is uh, some, some E. coli that's been labeled and, and put into an animal. Um, so that's one way that the, there are other ways of of labeling things. So uh, radio labels is, is a way that's sort of certainly taking off. So the idea is that you consume a radio label, you know, it might be a carbohydrate that, you know, only certain bacteria can metabolize. And you can follow that bacteria through these particular processes. And another process that um, people have been using or, or developing is through more specific to particular bacteria, such as uh, siderophores and, and these sorts of things, which only you know certain bacteria can utilize. So you, you're giving a label to siderophore, and and then it's finding its particular target bacteria. And you can see this uh, in this particular slide where it's the the animals lit up. And I'm not sure if you can see my pointer or not, but uh, I was pointing at. But what we're wondering is, can we actually see? bacteria directly with modalities like MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. And so, um, you know, this is an MRI machine and, and you've probably all seen one. Clinicians will be very familiar with them. A lot of advantages of using MRI. It's not invasive. It gives that high spatial resolution. It goes in deep. It's uh, very safe. And the way it works is essentially it uh, looks at sort of the water content and the iron and uh, manganese contents and the interactions uh, between these particles. And so uh, I've got to say that I really, working with physicists just blows my mind with the way that they understand this. And, and I feel like such a dummy talking to these people, but essentially the way that it works is that you have a magnet that aligns all these molecules. You have a radio frequency signal, which tips them over. And then the speed at which, you know, the molecules uh, in the tissue realign tells us about their surrounding tissue. So this is not a great example of an MRI, but what I wanted to show you was that there's a bright spot on this particular MRI. And the, the bright spot is where contrast has been given. So MRI is really good at looking at structure, but if there's something really specific that we want to look at, we might not see it against the background of other tissue. Now, the bright spot here has been given contrast in the form of iron. It's been given it in a genetic type of way. So it's enabled iron to come on board through a cellular mechanism. And this particular way uh, was using genes from this bacteria. And this is a magnetactic bacteria. And they have these little 
sort of magnetosomes within them and they line up and it tells the bacteria which way to swim, which is, I, I don't know why it does it, but that's what happens. But uh, what people have been doing, they've been utilizing some of these genes to add contrast to MRI. And we were thinking that perhaps we could use this to add contrast to some of the bacteria that we're interested in, some of the UPEX and, and those sorts of microorganisms. So we took uh, some of those, well, one of those genes, and we tried to transform it into a E. coli of interest and, and see uh, if that actually returned an MRI signal. So we did all this work in MRI phantoms, which are basically gelatin slabs that we put cells in because we can't just put slab, which we can't, can't just put cells onto an MRI. And it looks a, a little bit like this. It's sort of about the, the size of a child's head. You, you sort of put these cells in these containers and, and then you can put them in the air, MRI and measure them. So it, it, if you get a picture back, it looks like this. Some of the white spots um, are, are where we're, we're getting a return and, and there's a slice that's taken and it's measured. And uh, there's multiple things that are measured. Um, spin echo sequence or and uh, relaxation constants and, and all sorts of things. Um, but so there's different ways that physicists look at this. And, and I'm not an expert to to say, to, to actually detail this in a great measure, but I've sort of gone along with uh, their recommendation. So the uh, gene that we put into E. coli, unfortunately, uh, in this graph didn't actually yield a response even when we added iron, but we did notice an interesting thing in bacteria under MRI. So this is the return uh, in M MRI, so the relaxation rate. So we actually notice that bacteria themselves have a return via MRI, which was really interesting, really quick return. So if you were to look at uh, bladder cells, they sort of fall down in this range. So bacteria have a really interesting uh, return. And so we quickly looked at a couple of people's bladders and so bladder cells in the bladder. And we also found that these bladder cells didn't have much of a return. And this is sort of the focus of some other work and I'm not gonna go into this, but uh, we started looking at other E. coli. So we've got a collection of different E. coli in the lab. And, and so we first of all got out some of the commensals and, and lab strains that we had. And we found that they also had a return and also the uropathogenic strains. And we thought the uropathogenic strains might have more um, return because uh, th they have um, more sort of virulence associated sort of iron uptake uh, uh, on some of their um, islands that they possess. But uh, they certainly um, had returns and these were really reliable returns under the conditions that we were utilizing. And so, you know, one of the things that influences return can be, you know, the metals that they uptake. And so we, we looked at that and we found that the, the partially the answer, but not the entire answer to why these microbes were given a return. And then we started looking at some other microbes that we might find in the urogenital tract. There's a whole range here, and I'm not going to go into exactly what they are, but something uh, that we noticed really phenomenally was that lactobacilli had a huge return. And, and actually the biggest return was the lactobacillus crispatus. It's not actually on this graph, but um, it had the biggest return. And part of the reason was that these lactobacilli suck up uh, mag manganese, which is, they're not really iron utilizers, but uh, this this was really uh, kind of interesting. And we, we probably should have known this because we actually have worked in the sort of field of, of metals and lactobacilli before, but you know, potentially, you know, with development, something like this might be able to in vivo look for, you know, changes in, in the, the, the microbiota at a particular site. So as I was saying, we have worked with uh, lactobacilli and heavy metals before. This is cadmium. You can see white spots here of cadmium where the, the lactobacilli have sequestered them so that they have this interesting phenomenon. And we actually did some probiotic studies, which I'm just going to skip over here. So... Bacteria is certainly detectable by MRI. There's large variations between uh, within species and, and, and between species and certainly impacted by uh, metals. Uh, lactobacilli had big returns and, you know, potentially with under the MRI conditions, we could detect a certain amount. Maybe with a more powerful MRI, you could detect, uh, you know, a, a smaller amount. 
And we certainly could correlate um, the results that we got to, to cell counts. So, you know, potentially in the future, we can track uh, persistence and colonization of bacteria. So the work's still ongoing in this area, and I, I just want to skip to the next modality that we're interested in, and that is uh, positron emission tomography, PET, and combining that with MRI. Um, so again, the clinicians are probably familiar with this uh, technology. It's uh, used a lot in oncology, uh, uses radio traces uh, to, to for a whole lot of different things, including to measure change in uh, metabolic processes and other conditions. Um, and you can combine it with MRI to show not only that emitting uh, radio tracer, but actually the structure around it, which is incredibly powerful. So we're wondering, can we in fact also label microbes with a radioactive probe and uh, track them? So our uh, radioisotope of preference is zirconium-89. That's because it's widely used uh, where we are. Um, it's uh, clinically approved, and it's quite often uh, chelated with uh, DFO, which is used to chelate it to, to other things. Um, and so this is roughly how we stick it to microbes. So we have... Um, uh, the, the the radio label and the uh, DFO, and it actually sticks on to amino group, so it labels proteins uh, that might be sticking out uh, from the, the microbe. So this is how we, we label it. And uh, we have a number of studies going now looking at, you know, how it performs in vitro. So, um, and, you know, this is obviously never been done before, but, you know, we so it's, it's being used for, labeling um, other types of cells, but not microbial cells, and obviously never been delivered to places uh, like the urogenital tract. So we're doing some in vitro work around that. We're also doing some um, work with pigs to um, work out, you know, how how long, you know, the, the radioactive bits stick around and, and when's a good time for imaging and that sort of thing. So this is an oral study, but we're using a a, a urogenital lactobacillus crispatus just really for dosimetry purposes because we want to go to humans uh, relatively quickly and we need that information and also we're also um, developing you know a lot of tools around you know how to potentially image uh, the, the microbe and and also tracking all the microbiota that goes on at the same time uh, with more conventional analysis to see if our imaging uh, results match uh, the, the microbiome results. So um, the, the stability results that we're, we're generating, uh, uh, you know, in vitro and, and with uh, dual chamber studies to see if the label stays attached to make sure it doesn't dissociate, make sure it doesn't label other microbes. And at this stage, it, it does. It does uh, lose a bit of viability uh, when, when you attach a microbe to uh, a, a radionucleotide. But in saying that, we, we have been successful at uh, labeling gram positives, gram negatives, uh, fecal microbiota, transplant material, and E. coli phages. So th there could be quite a lot of uses to, to track microbes uh, in the body. So essentially, um, you know, we, we label the E. coli and it, it's a relatively successful labeling with over 80% of the, the E. coli labeled. And um, we tend to use about a billion uh, CFUs in a capsule, which are then given to a healthy pig. And according to, uh, you know, the imaging people I work with, this, this should give enough for about 30 days of imaging uh, because the half-life of this uh, radioisotope is about three and three and a third days. So this is what uh, it looks like um, just given to the pig at a few different time points. And you can see the the, the probiotic uh, Nissl uh, E. coli actually moves through and, and you can see where it's uh, potentially in, in the colon, uh, stomach and then colon. And actually, if you add the MRI component to this, you, you get a little bit more structure to this so you can get an idea. So I'm showing you an oral sort of version, but what I'd really love to do and, and sort of the purpose of today's talk is to really explore, you know, pe with people who might be interested in collaborating into the Euro uh, biome with this kind of technology because I, th I think it could answer a lot of uh, questions. You can also look at uh, the different parts of the animal um, after it's been sacrificed with um, 
what's called a whole body count. So you can put the whole animal into this, work out how much radiation is there, put in different uh, organs and see where it's gone. So uh, th this is uh, all, all the where all the radiation is. And interestingly, you can see that there's a large amount that is sitting in the kidneys. And it, I can't help thinking about Aaron Miller's talk uh, a couple of months ago, which, you know, he, he was very interested in, in microbes tracking uh, to the kidney and maybe entering the urobiome uh, in, in that way. Yeah, so so we're, we're obviously um, trying to follow up all these studies that we're doing with, you know, conventional qPCR and microbiota analysis to make sure we can find those microbes at the sites where imaging's identifying them. And so uh, radio, um, uh, autoradiography and, 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 and tools like that uh, are quite useful. So we're still working our way through this. This is still an early project. Um, we can also uh, do that type of segmentation by taking the um, imaging information that we uh, obtained during the imaging of the animal and segmenting it um, uh, later on. We, we collect a huge amount of information uh, that we we sort of get around to. And rather than sort of looking at uh, organs that are removed, we can actually do this by um, just tracking around um, the, the, the imaging data to, to work out where that sort of radioactivity uh, is. And, and I haven't actually shown you a very detailed um, perspective today, but you can zoom in quite a lot uh, on, on some of these uh, images. So I, I've really flown through this today and, and very minimal detail. Part of that's to protect my total lack of knowledge of anything to do with imaging. The, the second part is, um, you know, I really would, would encourage, you know, some collaboration in this area uh, for, for people that might have interesting, uh, um, you know, models or, or that sort of thing. Um, you know, this is a, a new uh, sort of use of this technology, but it's been around for a while. Um, you know, there's lots of potential things uh, that microbes do from an MRI perspective that might be exploited for further analysis. The radio labels might allow us to track, you know, those in, in vivo uh, localization um, events that occur in the bladder, and that would be really interesting, um, you know, to get, to get a whole lot of more information. So... Yeah, I'm, I'm really open to collaboration and, and, and thank you for the opportunity to give a very brief talk today. I'd like to thank um, members of the imaging team uh, here at Lawson, which uh, do an amazing job, and also um, my own lab group, which uh, supports this project. Uh, so thank you very much. Great. What a fascinating talk. I imagine we're gonna have some really great questions at the end. Um, that's not something I've thought about and I imagine for many other people, it's kind of a new area. And so hopefully we can have some good discussion after Dr. Carson's talk. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Lisa Carson. She's an assistant professor at Oregon Health and Science University in the Department of Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology with a joint appointment in obstetrics and gynecology. She received her PhD in chemistry from Princeton University and then completed postdoctoral work in bioinformatics and urogynecology uh, at Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Carsons runs an interdisciplinary group at OHSU in the Department of Medical Informatics and Division of Bioinformatics. And her research interests broadly span using bioinformatics to understand the complex relationship between, between the human microbiome and disease with a focus on women's health and bladder disorders. Um, She's collaborated with many clinicians and many folks in the audience today, and I'm really excited to hear her talk. Thank you, Seth. Um, so I'll share my screen here. So I'm really excited to be sharing some of my recent research with you all today and how I like to think about optimizing information to investigate the urobiome. Um, so I do like to uh, start with a disclaimer that I'm not a clinician, nor am I a microbiologist. I'm a bioinformaticist, and as Seth mentioned, I'm in the Department of Medical Informatics and Obstetrics and Gynecology. And I realize whenever I'm talking to an audience, um, there's typically some people that are not familiar with one or both of these areas of science. Um, so briefly, um, I'm primarily a bioinformaticist, which is someone who's very interdisciplinary and likes to take very complicated information and try to uh, distill it down into useful knowledge. And uh, many, but not all of the topics I investigate fall under urogynecology, which is a field of medicine that focuses on the bladder, 
reproductive organs and bladder um, and bowels. And while disorders that affect these organs are typically not life-threatening, they have a huge impact on quality of life from people that suffer from them. So given that this is a Eurobiome uh, research interest group and that you had Dr. Uh, Wolf speak to you last month, I'm gonna be very light in terms of background material. Um, I'm sure most of you are now familiar with the concept of urine not being sterile and the bladder containing a resident microbiome. And this work was primarily founded by Dr. Wolf and Dr. Brubaker in the early 2010s using uh, methods that could identify more than um, the typical uropathogens that were found by the standard during uh, culture or sucks as Dr. Wolf likes to call it. Um, this includes uh, enhanced or extended uh, expanded quantitative urine culture, which uses large volumes of uh, urine, long incubation times and different growth conditions. Um, in addition to several sequencing based, based methods such as marker gene sequencing and shotgun metagenomics. So briefly, shotgun metagenomics relies on sequencing the genomes of all the organisms that are present in a sample, and this includes the bacteria, fungi, viruses, and also, unfortunately, um, the host. This approach is very thorough, and it gives us information about what organisms are there and their genetic content or their functional potential. However, this approach has significant limitations, such as host DNA contamination, um, complexity, and expense. And importantly, the ideal use of this technology has not been um, well established for Eurobiome research yet, though I know several investigators here are, are working on that problem. And um, so far, there's only been a few studies uh, published using this approach, and many of them use voided specimens. Now, another approach that's very widely used is marker gene sequencing, and this is when we target a specific gene. To study bacteria, we target the 16S RNA gene. Um, to target other microbes such as fungi, we would use the ITS or the 18S RNA gene. Um, commonly, we only target a very small amplicon or a small region um, of the gene, though a full-length gene sequencing is becoming increasingly common. Now, this approach only provides taxonomic information about what types of bac bacteria or the microbe of interest is uh, present, but it does so at a mi much greater de detail and much greater depth um, than the shotgun-based approach. Now, importantly, both the, the shotgun metagenomics and marker gene sequencing Approaches do not require us to isolate and grow microbes to study them, so they hold really great potential for identifying and investigating microbial communities directly from patient or research participant samples. So um, if you're a little newer to this field, you might be wondering what the typical female urobiome is. And there's been several studies now um, that have addressed this that have controlled populations included in them. Um, illustrated here is just one um, example study. This is from the HMS uh, STEAM study, which was a large uh, observational cohort study ran by the Pelvic Floor Disorders Network to understand the urogenital microbiome in relation to uh, mixed urinary incontinence. Now, in this type of plot, um, each bar represents uh, the microbiome of an uh, individual's uh, sample, and the on the uh, y-axis here, we have the relative abundance of the bacteria that are in that sample. So for this participant, they have about 70% of lactobacillus, um, about 10 or so percent of uh, this green bacteria, which is Tepidomonas, and then um, the remaining 20 or so percent in their sample um, is other proteobacteria. So what we know about the female urinary microbiome is that it's typically a polymicrobial community, meaning that there's more than one bacteria that's often uh, present. In the female urobiome, it's typically a bacteria such as Lactobacillus, Gardnerella, um, and sometimes uh, other bacteria such as Escherichia that dominate the sample. Um, and there's several other bacteria that are commonly found, but not uh, necessarily dominant, such as Coronibacterium, and actinomyces, among others. Now here's a similar 
um, plot that's representing data from a study of the male urobiome. And this study has not been published yet. Um, it's under review and it will be posted in a uh, bio archive relatively soon. This project was led by uh, Dr. Uh, Kate uh, Bowie, who was in my group and just defended her PhD last week. Um, so similar to the female urobiome, uh, we see that the male urobiome is a polymicrobial community. Um, it does appear that the male urobiome is more diverse than the female um, urobiome, though these samples are voided specimens, so it's not a direct comparison. And um, typically, if we do see a dominant bacteria in the male uh, urobiome, it tends to be a bacteria, a different type of bacteria, such as Staphylococcus or Neisseria. Um, and we do see several other bacteria that are commonly seen um, across men, such as Coronibacterium and um, Bacteroidetes and Prevotella, um, but these are at a lower abundance. So while sequencing-based approaches have been widely used to study the human microbiome, we do need to be careful when we're applying these techniques to the urobiome. And one key challenge is that the bladder is a low microbial biomass environment when there's not an acute active infection going on. And this means that there's less bacteria present when compared to other body sites. Um, and some of the assumptions in methodology may no longer hold true. Also, the urobiome was initially left out of several of the initial human microbiome investigations. Um, so the knowledge that we're gathering is relatively new, and we're essentially playing catch up to those other um, microbial fields. And we can't ignore these two issues. And there's been several reviews, and I have two of them listed here if, if you uh, will, would like to find out about these um, issues in more detail. So now I'm gonna uh, shift a little to um, some of the more technical aspects of urobiome uh, science, uh, which are really um, important in, in my mind. So first we'll talk about how we're optimizing sequence-based uh, studies by identifying contaminants and improving taxonomy uh, resolution. So contaminant DNA is an issue for most sequence-based uh, studies, um, and it's referring to any microbial DNA that did not originate from the biological sample itself. And there's several different sources um, of contaminant DNA, which makes it kind of tricky to detect computationally. Now here I have a word cloud that's a collection of bacteria that were noted in several studies that have reported findings from their negative controls. So what do you see in this word cloud? I know I see a lot of extremophiles, such as um, Deinococcus and Rubrobacter. These are bacteria that are typically seen in extreme environments, such as um, geysers in Yellowstone Park. Um, and I, I would hope that they're not part of the human microbiome. Um, we also see several other lab-associated bacteria uh, that are um, those found with uh, reagents, kits, and water, such as uh, Pseudomonas and Stenotrepomonas. And importantly, we see several human associated bacteria such as Lactobacillus and Escherichia. So uh, what this list really indicates is not necessarily that we're doomed and we can't trust sequencing studies, but it really points out that we can't just take a list of common contaminants and remove them from our data sets because we'd be removing a lot of um, well-known bacteria that would be expected to be in our communities. So, how my group approaches this is we essentially perform a mini experiment within each of our um, studies. We, we uh, create a mi mock microbial dilution series, and I highly recommend a similar set of controls um, in your own uh, low microbial biomass work. Um, so we create this from using a undiluted mock uh, microbial community. Uh, we purchase ours from Zymo, but you can create one in your own lab or purchase from another vendor. Um, and then it goes under several rounds of a serial dilution, ideally uh, spanning the expected microbial load of our samples. And then this collection of samples is processed um, right alongside of all of our biological specimens um, undergoing all the same processes. Now, here's the results of a mock microbial dilution series after sequencing the V4 region of the 16S RNA gene. Um, as we expected, we don't see many contaminants in the undiluted sample, which is right here, and we detect all the expected uh, bacteria in about the abundance we anticipated. Um, 
And then as we go along our dilution series, we see uh, the introduction of contaminants, which are these uh, gray bacteria. Um, and by the time we get to the sixth dilution, we see that, that over 50% of the sample is made up of these unexpected uh, bacterial taxa and individual bacteria um, that are contaminants actually make up a larger abundance than the expected taxa. So this has several implications for our downstream analyses. Um, we have um, this contaminant problem will artificially increase our um, measures of diversity and also artificially decrease the abundances of the real bacteria that are there. So um, aside from trying to do best practices in the lab, we can try to computationally remove these contaminants. And there's several approaches that have been um, published in the literature. My group performed a benchmarking study um, that I recommend you look into it, if you'd like these uh, to apply this to your own. We also have the code available to, to um, apply this to new data. And um, basically what we showed was that as we increase the um, amount of contaminants, which is along this x-axis, um, you know, we can attempt, we can measure the accuracy um, because we know the ground truth in this mock microbial dilution series. Um, and what we found was that the negative control filter really performed quite poorly. So this is when we just uh, take any uh, signal that's in our uh, negative control and just remove it from our data set. And that's highly uh, not recommended because um, even when you have no contaminants, it will be removing some of the expected signal from your data set due to a um, technical sequencing error that's called a barcode crosstalk. Um, we applied several other methods and ideally what we would see is that the accuracy would be very high. Um, and you can see that for some methods they perform fairly well, um, but with the same method with different parameters, they perform quite poorly. And um, what this uh, experiment really showed was that no method was perfect. Um, and we identified that uh, most of the methods that worked really well in terms of not removing the expected taxa, but removing the contaminant taxa required additional information, such as measurements of uh, DNA for each individual sample or a number of controls or a uh, well-defined um, experimental community, which we unfortunately don't have for the uh, your biome. We also identified that parameterization is really experiment dependent. So you can't um, you know, optimize uh, the, the computational parameters um, on a, a separate sequencing run. You really need to do it per sequencing run. Now, in addition to the methods that we assess, there's several other methods that have been coming out um, to detect contaminants from sequencing studies. And as we're applying these to your biome research studies, we need to make sure that we have good experimental design um, with respect to both positive and negative controls. Um, often we will need additional information such as DNA concentration or uh, a number of controls. So we wanna make sure that we're planning appropriately um, for that when we're collecting our samples. Um, and additionally, this requires a lot of exploratory data analysis to try to understand the correct um, application of parameters. And finally, it does require a team effort to review and discuss the results of that exploratory data analysis to make the final call on whether or not we're deciding a individual bacterium or a sequence will be a contaminant or not. And finally, it does require a lot of patience because unfortunately, this is not as straightforward as we would like to see as scientists. Now, my group has also performed an in-depth analysis evaluating the different components that are necessary for um, identifying the types of bacteria at the species level from 16S-based studies. Um, this step is called taxonomy assignment, and there are several important components, uh, such as the database that we use, um, the identifier, or the 16S RNA gene sequencing variable, or amplicon, um, and the classification algorithm. Now, just to briefly highlight the results of this study, um, what we found was that of these three different components, the one that was most important was actually the database, the reference database that we use, um, which is represented in colors in this graph um, that, that is showing the percent of bacteria that were correctly uh, classified for any given classification scheme. Um, 
And what we found was that the NCBI 16S uh, database was the most uh, comprehensive and had the best performance. However, this database is not currently incorporated in many of the microbiome data um, processing tools. So we do need to keep that in mind when we're um, reviewing manuscripts, right? We can't expect everybody to use this method if they don't have um, the ability to, to apply custom bioinformatics. Um, additionally, uh, Silva was the next best, um, though you do need to make sure that you're using an updated or, or one of the latest versions of it. And finally, uh, green genes had the worst performance since many of the microbiome, uh, eurobiome species um, were missing from that database. And importantly, at the time of the study, green genes had not been updated in quite a long time, um, but recently it was updated. And I am uh, pretty confident that that newer version will have improved performance for the eurobiome. And I'd also like to add a quick note about lactobacilli. Um, so there was a recent update in the lactobac um, in lactobacilli uh, taxonomy, uh, taxonomy. Um, and this is really important when we're uh, trying to compare across studies and also as we're processing new data. We want to make sure that we're not accidentally missing key species in our analysis due to a technical error such as filtering by lactobacillus. And this table is just showing some of the major um, changes, which is, um, you know, that lactobacillus KCI is now lactobacillus KCI bacillus KCI, uh, right? So this might seem like a very trivial uh, thing, but this can uh, cause a lot of bioinformatic problems. Now to shift gears a little, I'm going to talk about some of my work, uh, the work my group has done on thinking beyond bacterial taxonomy. So as a bioinformaticist, I really do love sequencing data, but sequencing data is not always going to be the most important or the most relevant information, right? There's a lot of heterogeneity between the types of bacteria that we see in individuals. However, those bacteria um, are likely sharing some functionality to perform similar tasks in the bladder environment. So we need to begin to uh, make a shift in uh, what we're measuring of the microbiome and uh, start to explore these functional components. So my group started looking at lichens in the bladder, and this was work that was led by Dr. Uh, J.P. Gordin, who is a glycobiologist that was in my group and is now at Lewis and Clark College starting his own uh, lab. So why are we interested in glycans? Well, glycans are complex carbohydrates and sugars, and they play a central roles in biology. Particularly, they saw, serve as a uh, carbon source um, as a mode of energy for um, bacteria. So we asked, are there alterations in urinary glycans in women that have overactive bladder compared to those without? Um, and this was really motivated by work that has been done by uh, my group and others that have shown that bacterial communities are altered in women with overactive bladder and urgency urinary incontinence, but there's not necessarily a clear single uh, bacterium that seems to be responsible for that. So in this study, we had three groups of women. Um, we had controls with no known uh, lower urinary tract symptoms. And then we had uh, women that had urinary urgency and um, frequency, but no incontinence. These were called overactive bladder dry. And then we had women that had urinary urgency, frequency, um, and, incont and urge related incontinence. And these were urgency urinary incontinence or UUI group. As you can see from this table, uh, these women were fairly similar in terms of age, uh, BMI, and um, estrogen use, um, though there are some differences, but they did not reach significance. So the data we collected in additional to uh, clinical questionnaires was catheterized urine specimens, which we subject to a glycomics mass spectrometry panel with uh, collaborators at Emory University. We identified 58 free oligosaccharides um, that were classified into these five groups based on their terminal features. And when we looked at the types of free oligosaccharides across our three groups, we identified that there were several differences between the uh, OAB dry group and um, UUI, as well as the OAB um, dry group and controls. And this kind of surprised us because we were expecting to see differences between the control and UUI group. Um, however, they, they most of the times had similar uh, measures of these different free oligosaccharides. So finally, to wrap up this talk, um, I wouldn't be a good informaticist if I didn't have some keynotes about reporting and sharing data. So I'm just going to talk briefly about this. Um, 
So as you noticed from today's talk uh, from mine and Dr. Burton's as well, um, microbiome research is really interdisciplinary and there's lots of important details in each component of a study. To help researchers in this field, the, there was a um, the strengthening, the organizing and reporting of microbiome or the storms checklist was developed. Um, and this is not Eurobiome specific, but it's very comprehensive and it can be used as a guide for writing, reading and reviewing uh, microbiome manuscripts. And I strongly recommend that you check out this manuscript and the um, associated website because it has really great templates and flow charts available for researchers to use. And finally, as part of the Eurobiome consensus that was developed in 2020, the community began discussing what information should ideally be collected for Eurobiome research studies. And uh, this was published in a M Systems manuscript in 2021. Um, and in conjunction with the National Microbiome Data Collaborative and the Genetic Genomic Standards Consortium, we've developed a mixed X checklist that should be available uh, relatively soon. So to summarize, um, I know I talked about a lot today. Um, there's several different approaches that we can use to measure the Eurobiome and each have their own pros and cons. Um, the Eurobiome is a really unique environment and we need to make sure that we're um, studying it with robust um, methodologies to identify contaminants and making sure that we're using um, up-to-date bioinformatic tools and databases. Um, also, it's really important to consider sharing um, the data and using community standards because this will enable uh, reuse and methodologic development for uh, Eurobiome purposes. And um, I know I just briefly touched on going beyond sequencing. I think Dr. Burton did a wonderful job showing uh, the all the other things we could do um, in that respect too. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and um, all of my, my uh, acknowledge all my many great collaborators, trainees and uh, funders. Um, there's also several opportunities um, that my department has available and I have them noted here for undergraduates, um, postdocs and um, PhD uh, candidates. We also have clinical informatics and uh, urogynecology uh, fellowships for um, MDs. So thank you.